Thanks, my brother. Nice All the best, today. Eh? Nice one. Thank nice you. one. Welcome back. We're still on the conversation at the budget speech. Uh, right now we're going to continue and we're going to speak to our music artist, uh, Mr. Andy T. I trust that you're good? Yes, yes, you got it. Right. Tell us a bit about yourself, just briefly. Who is Mr. Andy T? Okay, well, thank you so, so much for having me here. Firstly, I'd like to welcome you guys uh, at Kharib Moharib Dam because this is my district. Uh, I'm hosting you actually today. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Andy T. Birth name Andy Lechokolo. Born, bred, and battered Kobetuli. About 50 k's from Karib Dam. Uh, that's where I come from. I'm a music artist. I'm a business person as well. So Ndate Andy T. Jono kasi bini. We put a wrong secret to Hana Mona Tatinena Nakasheko to a budget speech. May when I only be letting Kapo. Good luck to Tabila Holo to be part of this program. And Luto Huto, what is you know out there for the artists? Mm. Uh, artists are go free state at large mm. uh, because I know furthermore budget is like cascade or down to the different districts, but it's important as an artist. Um, at Bangkok Free State to come in here, what is happening, what is it, what is it that is there for us um, as the artist. Okay. And Tata Indy. Of 2.20 of arts and culture or it catered for, amongst others, support to arts and culture EPWP program, community media, library services, and infrastructure development, which includes the construction of the National Training Center, Charles Mubedi Stadium, and minor re renovations at the Fezile Dabi Stadium. So my question to you is, do you think that the money fulfilled that which it was sent for in the way that it was supposed to? Um, to, to a certain extent it did, but you know, there's, there's more that could have been done. Because you still have artists that haven't received, you know, the relief fund. Um, yeah. The first batch, the second batch, they still haven't received anything. And we all understand that it has been a difficult period with the COVID-19. Artists can't have their own events. Artists can't be booked because that, there are no events. Yeah. So we still have artists who are still waiting to be compensated. Um, it's a sad situation. I think there we could have, we could have done better. Mm -hmm. Again, I think with this, with this money, more could have been done for districts that are, you know, underprivileged. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. to to bring more infrastructure there. You know, uh, the previous speaker did mention that Karib is a small town. I mean, it's a small district. We 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 could have received something like an art center or something, particularly in this time where there was no much activities. I think infrastructure could have been developed, you know, so that when we go back to our normal lives, at least to Kukharipi, there is something that is tangible that can really assist our artists. Um, another thing, go, and I'll talk for Kharip because I'm in Kharip, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we yeah. don't have resources. It's difficult to get to Bloemfontein where most of the budget is spent, you know. Mm -hmm. I think more can be done to bring, you know, Infrastructure go harib and resources go harib as well. Okay. Uh, what kind of resources maybe to live a little bit more? The district in Harib, 
specifically to, to the artists yeah. and uh, people dealing with art in general? I think infrastructure. We don't have even a single art center Kokharib, that is operational. There is no art center. There is no space for our artists to be trained in terms of the art itself or the business side of the artist. So bring stuff like that. Bring the, the, the business side, education on the business side. Our artists are not exposed. They are far from things, you know. So all of this stuff can be brought closer to them so that they feel like they're part of it. I'm one of the lucky people because I can get out of Harib and go to Bloom and go to Jobek and go to Cape Town. But most of our artists have not had that exposure. So if, if art centers could be brought, training programs could be brought, it would be very good for our artists this side. Thank you. Uh, still on the subject of educating artists, from how early on do you think kids should be encouraged to pursue their talents if that is something that they would like to do? I think from as soon as we discover the talent, most of the time it happens at home. You know, when I'm on a go high, they will start mumbling, malegao, bolekanya, every song that sings yeah. or that plays on the radio. So right there, you start nurturing that talent. Some they'll be working with their hands. You can see olekao kopanya dinto. You can see from that age. And when we get to school, I think it's important again that investment is done on the subjects that are, are, are condoning arts so that Banabarona, they can learn from there. And if you groom them from that age, by the time Balim Baholo, um, they are well-seasoned artists, you know. They, they know a lot about the art part of things, and I believe school as well can contribute in teaching them about the business part of art. Okay. Dade Andy, thank you for your time, and thank you for keeping up with our different languages as well. We surely hope to hear more of your music and more of your content, and we also hope that these suggestions will be seen more in the industry and with regards to the Department of Arts and Culture. Otherwise, we are done, and we're closing our segment. Thank you for watching and listening. Right now, we're going to continue with the budget speech. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to even mention. No, are you?
Ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable Speaker, Mr. Fuba. Yes, sir. The Honourable Speaker, Mr. Fuba. We are now going to have a moment for prayers and meditations. Thank you, honorable members. We may be seated. Welcome, honorable members, but before we can proceed, let me also take time to acknowledge and welcome all our distinguished guests. Um, good afternoon, honorable premier, Mayor Sisindombela, the deputy speaker to the Free State Legislature, Mayor Honorable Mabena, Chairperson of Chairpersons of Committees, Honorable Khadebe, Honorable Chief Whip, Honorable Meko, Leader of Government Business, Honorable Bulwane, the MEC, Premier of the Free State, Members of the Legislature, Members of the Executive Council, the Executive Mayor of Harib District, Her Worship Mayor Methomakulu, Members of Parliament, MPs that are present, our Permanent delegates to the NCOP. Ki Annelebuteng, Badi traditional leaders represented here. The Provincial House of Traditional Leaders, Hosin Khale, Zotezi, Hosi Khadin Zwaiki, Muroka, Hosana Kopano. Mukage Mangaung Local House, Murena Lerotodi, Mupedi Tabomvusa Nyana Local House, Murena Paulos Muloi, Hosatana Puleng Muloi, the Kai Korana House of Traditional Leaders, the Greeka 
Royal House. Provincial Commissioner of Police, Lieutenant Brigadier Baile Mutsonyane. Local government leaders present here. Heads of Chapter 9 and 10 institutions. Leaders of government entities. Business and financial sector leaders present here. Leaders of civil society. Members of faith-based organizations. Members of media houses. Sichabasa Frey Stata present here and those following the proceedings on social media and broadcasts. Distinguished guests, I welcome you all. Honorable members, before we proceed with the business of the day, I wish to inform the House that I have informed all honorable members of the place and time of today's sittings that the provincial budget will be tabled here at Harib Dam Hydro Park. The information about the venue was communica communicated in terms of section 1103 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa of 1996. Honorable members, the business of the House today is to afford MEC for Finance to table the provincial annual budget for 2022-2023 as required by Section 27.2 of Public Finance Management Act number 1 of 1999. We then proceed, honorable members, to motions of the day in terms of Rule 167 and Rule 168. We proceed to motions. The Secretary shall read Motion 1. That may be granted for the tabling of the second adjustment appropriation bill number 1 of 2022. The Honorable M.E.C. Brown. Honorable Speaker, I move. Any discussion? Any objection? Leave granted. The Honorable MEC may table the second adjustment appropriation bill B1 2022. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Good day, Honorable Speaker, Mayor Zanile Sifuba, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Malusi Mapena. Um, please pause, Honorable MEC, um, Honorable Feinfiren. On a point of clarity, perhaps, we haven't received the speech or the hard copy of this. Uh, normally, like in the previous SOPA speech, we receive it. We haven't received that. Difficult to follow. Thank you, Speaker. Okay. Can I request that that be uh, dealt with? I take note of that, Honorable. Uh, 
Um, yes, Honorable uh, Chief Whip. Now, Speaker, we, we are requesting that we can proceed so long because the MEC is presenting an adjustment budget. We are not yet at an appropriation bill stage. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Chief Whip, I wanted to ascertain myself uh, of the whereabouts of the speech before I can make that ruling. So um, I'm informed that uh, in five minutes' time, the speech will be here. Uh, may I request Honorable MEC to proceed? Thank you once again, Honorable Speaker, Mazanile Sifuba, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Malusi Mapena, our Honorable Premier, Masisi Ntombela, members of the Executive Council, members of the Free State Legislature, Executive Mayors and Mayoral Committee members, Director General, Heads of Departments, Chairpersons of our public entities, Board members, leaders of our um, traditional leaders, the Provincial Business Executive and Office of the Auditor General, um, our esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to appreciate the opportunity granted by this August House to present the 2021-22 Second Adjustment Budget speech. The Second Adjustment Budget makes provision for the reallocation of reprioritized funds, shifting of funds to address and defray possible overexpenditure within votes. The environments of those funds that are in excess of 8% between programs within votes as dictated by Section 43, Subsection 2 of the Public Finance Management Act. Furthermore, the 2021-22 Second Adjustment Budget caters for additional funds allocated to the province during storm damages. These funds are provided in line with the, Devenue, the Division of Revenue Act and allocated through the emerging Emergency Housing Grant. Finally, the Adjustment Budget provides for reallocation of funds to other provinces in compliance with Section 19 of the Division of Revenue Act. Honourable Speaker, when we tabled the 2021-22 Adjustment Budget during November last year, we reiterated and acknowledged the challenging fiscal position of the province. We further alluded to the continuing fiscal consolidation that has resulted in budget cuts across all departments and impacted negatively on the impetus of our service delivery within the province. Honourable Members, in an effort to deal with the, these fiscal challenges during the current financial year, some of the provincial departments and entities uh, within the province has thoroughly analysed and evaluated all its expenditure items. Programs and projects funded through our equitable share with a view to reprioritise funds towards the identified budget pressures. The total funds identified in the last quarter of the 2020 uh, 2020-2021 financial year amounts to 86.335 million and we identified from the following departments um, an amount of 30.135 million reprioritized from provincial treasury 22 million reprioritized from department of cooperative governance and traditional affairs 30 million is reprioritized from the office of the premier and 4.2 million is reprioritized from the department of sports arts culture and recreation the above mentioned funds are reprioritized towards the following budget pressures 31 million to destia for smme support industrialization and addressing pressures relating to the free state Develop development corporation 4.2 million to social development towards addressing the Engo Court judgment related costs, 32 million to public works and infrastructure for municipal service debts, and Department of Agriculture and Rural Development was allocated 15.135 million to address budget for shortfalls on international bursaries. The Free State Provincial Legislature will further receive 4 million in support of public participation. 
We have also, in consultation with the provincial legislature, allocated an amount of 8.267 million from retained revenue as an arm of the state. This amount will assist in addressing some internal budget pressures. Honourable members, this allocation is not cash backed as per the requirements of Section 23, Subsection 1 of the Financial Management of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act, called FAMBLA 2009. Honourable Speaker, we've also received funds to the tune of 10.375 million towards the Department of Human Settlement relating to disaster or provincial emergency housing grant in line with Schedule 7 of the Devenue, D Division of Revenue Act 2021. These funds will be utilised for construction of temporary housing structures in the Tabo Fitsaniana district. Honourable Members, owing to the external challenges in implementation of projects, an amount of 65.190 million from the province is reallocated to other provinces in compliance with Section 19 of the Division of Revenue Act. Honourable Speaker, I hereby table the 2021-2022 Second Adjustment Appropriation Bill. I thank you. What does the Honourable MEC propose? that the bill be referred to the Portfolio Committee on Public Accounts and Finance, as well as the Budget and Oversight Committee for consideration and report back to the House. Any discussion, honorable members? Any objection? Thank you. Thank you, honorable speaker. Approved. The bill stands referred to the Portfolio Committee on Public Accounts and Finance as well as the Budget and Oversight Committee for consideration and report back to the House. Honourable Members, we proceed to Motion 2. The Secretary shall read Motion 2. That will be granted for the tabling of the Appropriation Bill Number 2 of 2022. The Honourable M.C. Brown. Honourable Speaker, I move. Any discussion? Any objection? Leave granted. The Honourable MEC may table the appropriation bill B2 2022. The Secretary shall read the bill for the first time. The appropriation bill. The Honourable MEC may now address the House. Thank you once again, Honorable Speaker, and salutations, greeting, um, acknowledgements to all. Once again, Honorable Speaker Mazanele Sifuba, Deputy Speaker Malusi Mapena, Honorable Premier Masisin Tombela, members of the Executive Council, members of the Free State Legislature, Executive Mayors, Mayors and Councillors present today, House of Traditional Leaders, board members of state-owned entities, chairpersons of various CETAs, director general of the province, heads of respective departments, chief executive officers, and leaders of our public and private institutions, municipal managers, leaders of industry, business, civil society, special guests, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, Dumelang, Moweni, Hoyamadakh, good afternoon, assalamu alaikum. Honourable Speaker, it is an honour and privilege to table before this House the 2022 Medium Term Expenditure Framework Provincial Budget Speech for the Free State Province. Honourable Speaker, before I begin the tabling of this budget speech, I would like to send my heartfelt condolences to fa the family of Leticia Modise, who worked at the Department of Sports, Arts, Culture and Recreation. Gender-based violence, which in many cases leads to tragic fatalities, which is still prevalent within our communities. We will continue to fight this pandemic and we will not be tolerant of any type of abuse, even within our very own departments. Honorable Speaker, the tabling of the provincial budget coincides with the International Women's Day which was celebrated on the 8th of March, 2022.
This day has been earmarked for the celebration of the historical, cultural and political achievements of women across the globe. Throughout history, women have always had to fight for their recognition in social, political and economic environments. We pay tribute and salute women like Dr. Ngozi Iweala, the first female and first African to head the World Trade Organization. Dr. Ellen Johnson Seelif, yes, you may, you may give her a round of applause. <laughs> Through you, Speaker, Dr. Ellen Johnson Seelif, the former president of Liberia, who is a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts to further women's rights. And our very own Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nguka, the former Deputy President of the country and former Executive Director of the United Nations Women. These women are... Yes, thank you. These women are an inspiration to young people all over the world who aspire to serve their nations. I further table this provincial budget, Honourable Speaker, today as the World Bank completed a study and pronounced yesterday that South Africa is rated number one out of 164 countries that is the most unequal country in the world, with race playing a determining factor in which society where 10% of the population owns more than 80% of the country's wealth. By EWN News 9th March 2022, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, and people of this province, from a humanitarian perspective, no country can flourish, no nation can flourish without all its citizens participating in the mainstream of the economy. When we say that we should defend our democratic gains, this is one mandate that we should hold fiercely and robustly when it comes to economic transformation. On the global economic outlook, Honorable Speaker, a broad overview of the global economic growth in 2022 shows a weaker than expected growth rate, mainly due to the high transmissibility of less fatal Omicron variant raising energy prices, notably oil, the Ukraine-Russian conflict and the continuing US-China trade tension, the persistent global supply chain disruption, the cumulative effect of these unanticipated emergent shocks on global growth has led to tight fiscal conditions and higher inflation across advanced and emerging and developing economies creating a tight financial consolidation and condition and spinning into domestic currencies. To paint a clear picture, Honourable Speaker, the latest growth projections in January by the International Monetary Fund reveal a dampened glo global growth of 4.4% in 2022, compared to the predicted 5.9% global growth in October last year with a further decline to 3.8% in 2023. A further geo geopolitical tension remains a downside risk to, glo to global growth. Inflation rate and commodity prices. A case in point is the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, as I mentioned above, which has led to a raft of sanctions being imposed on Russia. A significant source of oil and natural gas supply for example, the US, Britain, France and European region, Canada and Australia since last week have already affected global prices of oil, which topped above 100 US dollars per barrel for the first time since 2014. The Russian-Ukraine tensions could cause oil scarcity and fuel prices globally. On the domestic output, output, coming back to South Africa, ladies and gentlemen, through you, Speaker, on economic growth project, uh, projections by National Treasury, it's expecting that South African economy to slow down to 2.2% in 2022, with a further decline of 1.6% in 2023. 
Despite South Africa's gain from rising commodity prices, the contagious COVID-19 pandemic and the recent social unrest in July 2021 in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal, and, and the interrupted electricity supply due to load shedding, exert a notable adverse impact on economic activity, total productivity and economic growth. The annual inflation rate in South Africa rose to 5.9% in December 2021, prompting the South African Reserve Bank to raise interest rates by 25 basis points. This contractionary policy stance causes a marginal reduction in the inflation rate to 5.7% in January 2022. The latest Monetary Policy Committee statement released on 27th January 2022 affirms an expected average inflation rate of 4.9% for 2022. After the inflation rate in 2021 averaged at already 4.5%. With rising oil and fuel prices and electricity costs, it is anticipated that the inflation rate will only move below 5% the 5% level towards the second half of the year. Coming to the province, Honourable Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Honourable Premier, the rapid rollout of vaccines has strengthened the economic performance of our province, which has boosted business confidence and investment and ensures that there is no going back to the hard lockdowns of 2020. We are still confronted by the increasing variants of the coronavirus disease like the Omicron variant. Honorable Speaker, the provincial economy is projected to grow at an average annual growth rate of 1.8% from 2020 to 2025. The weak economic outlook has spurred the province to look for alternative solutions. And one of those solutions is to prioritize local procurement, to assist local businesses to participate fully in the value chains, and thus enable them to employ more local people. In line with the Free State Growth and Development Strategy, the following programs will receive attention. Supporting infrastructure projects to be delivered on time and on budget. Procuring from local businesses, and the MEC of Destia's bowl will be able to attest to that. Support SMMEs and cooperatives owned by Africans in particular, women, youth, and disabled people. Agricultural support, tourism support, improving and supporting e-governments and e-learning is an issue that was sharply raised by one of our grade 12s during the budget competition that MEC Tate Mahwe and I had during this budget speech preparations. In the competition, the learner says, no learner should be left behind. Honorable Speaker, despite the tumultuous macroeconomic conditions, labor, and fiscal challenges that South Africa is facing, it is succinctly painted in the preceding discourse. I remain optimistic that over the medium-term expenditure framework period, strict adherence to conservative and growth-enhancing fiscal consolidation strategy, a significant reduction in government debt and associated borrowing costs, political willingness to implement well-targeted structural reforms that have expanded social protection and redistribution at its core, a proactive plan to curtail an expanding public wage bill as well as Intensive public investment in durable infrastructure, among others, will go a long way to support an inclusive job creation growth and also to ensure financial sustainability in the long run. Honourable Speaker, Honourable Premier, members of this legislature and the House, it would be amiss of me not to talk about job creation and economic drivers as we, as the EXCO, put together this budget speech. In order to continue with our commitment as the provincial government to create a conducive environment for the province to grow, we have to unpack those specific key economic drivers. By 1994 on water, Honorable Speaker, only 51% of the South African population had access to clean drinking water. 
In 2022, we had increased those figures to 88.6%. Thank you. The Municipal Infrastructure Grant was allocated 781 million in the 2021-22 financial year as the DORA Act, which is Division of Revenue, a total amount of 210 million is allocated for capital water projects, 203 million on sanitation projects, 171 million on roads and water storm projects. These are funding directly towards local government, specifically on the infrastructure of water and storm water projects. Capital Water Projects is by far the leading line item which reiterates our commitment to improve our target. Bloom Water will be launching a mega project of 500 million from Valbedracht Dam to Bloemfontein and will also be upgrading the Ristfontein Waterworks. On another key economic driver which is electricity. So without water, without electricity, an industry won't flourish, right? So on electricity, thank you. By 1994, Honorable Speaker, only 36% of the total South African population had their homes electrified. Whilst in 2020, we have increased that percentage to 84%. Thank you very much to our ANC-led government. We support the national government's effort on reforming the electricity sector to allow a competitive power supply to address electricity sustainably and sustainable supply shortage in South Africa. This intervention entails the lifting of the registration threshold embedded generation to 100 megawatts and amendments to the Electricity Regulation Act of 2006. In the spirit of, the pres of our President, President Ramaphosa's speech in 2021, our President raised licensing threshold for self-energy generation from 1 megawatt to 100 megawatts solely to expand the capacity of electricity and electricity generation. It has been argued that this particular reform makes electricity generation competitive, but that is what our people called for, didn't we? Also, independent grid operators would be able to purchase electricity at the lowest price, either publicly from ESCOM or privately through energy generators. On land, Honorable Speaker, during the 2021 State of the Province Address, our Honourable Premier, Mantombella, outlined the following, and I quote, open quote, We have commenced with our programme to distribute land to our people. We have 4,872 land parcels valued at over 11 billion rands. Out of these land parcels, the total number of pieces of land of 2,626 have been earmarked to be transferred to the rightful beneficiaries, close quote. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that this province is well on the way to ensure that electricity, water, and land are key assets to industrialization, production, and job creation. As a province, we will continue As a province, we will continue with the distribution of land within the prescripts of our regulation, the Land Management Act. It cannot be emphasized enough that land is a key economic driver and a tool to create those sustainable jobs. With that said, Honorable Speaker, linking to that is public-private partnerships. Triple Ps are designed to meet the institution's needs and to fill the funding gap between the state and the gap that the state might have. Triple P projects often involve the private sector, design, build, funding, and operate. 
the required or identified infrastructure. A well-constructed and managed triple P program takes advantage of the potential of efficiency gains through the use of the private sector. Free State Provincial Government commits to deepening the private sector partnerships and as our Honourable President had stated in his State of the Nation address, our social compact is critically important. So as we do that, we would like to improve gross productivity growth, drive techno technological and skills spill over from the private sector to government, allow efficient execution of infrastructure projects, and of course, National Treasury, to, together with Provincial Treasuries, completed a review of Triple P regulatory framework to ensure that we address those challenges and that the pace of the planning of these projects will allow to swiftly deliver services to our people. On infrastructure, Honourable Premier, Honourable Speaker, the total infrastructure projects within the province for the 2022-23 financial year is 4.564 billion. The percentage share and distribution of those projects per districts are as follows. 31% will go to Mangaun Metro. 20% to Vizili Dabi District. 19% to Tabum Futsanyana. 16% to Lejwele Putswa. And 7% to Karip. Infrastructure is a central lever for investment and a key driver for creating jobs. The national guideline used as a conservative base indicates that for every one million spent on an infrastructure project, seven full-time equivalent jobs will be created. Treasury will monitor this outcome. The province is committed to a fair and equal distribution of resources across districts so that we do not produce a skewed economic growth between districts in our province. Madam Speaker, I must outline that underspending on infrastructure conditional grants remains a challenge to our infrastructure development. As the executive, we hold departments accountable on quarterly review processes in EXCO, and as members of this provincial legislature through various committees, they too hold departments accountable for the under expenditure. Honorable Speaker, through you, we'd like to advise SMMEs that we condemn constant vandalism on construction sites we also wish to inform SMMEs that with the inclusive initiative on projects, we intend to involve local contractors. The vandalism on our projects threaten their successful completion, compromising value for money and quality of delivery. We urge contractors to resolve challenges for projects and it should be completed on time. Honorable Speaker, during the previous budget statement, I had indicated that the province would invest more than 13.8 billion in infrastructure development over the next three financial years. So with this term, on 2022-23, the allocation for infrastructure is 4.564 billion. On the 2023-24 financial year, it would be 4.524 billion and the 2024-25 financial year, 4.742 billion. We are hopeful that this investment and constant investment will contribute significantly towards the development of our province. It will contribute to the opportunities for SMMEs, not only direct contractual agreements, but also across the construction supply chain. Local is lacquer. Honourable Speaker, I have to address the road infrastructure in our province, and it's also critical to economic growth. We have the VAL a Free State Node, we have the KZN Free State Node, we've got the Northern Cape, uh, Eastern Cape Free State Node, and this talks directly to our logistics and distribution sectors of our economy. Our the province's core competitive advantage is its centricity. So as we talk about these logistics and distribution sector, and as they flow through these road nodes, 
throughout the province, we have to ensure that our infrastructure is upgraded. So we intend to spend 279 million on existing infrastructure earmarked for the rehabilitation and upgrading of our roads during the 2022-23 financial year. A further 967 million is set aside to ensure that roads in our province are properly maintained whilst a small portion of 10 million will be invested in new roads. The road maintenance fund that the Department of Roads, um, Police Roads and Transport in the prov province has a conditional grant of 1.45 billion and National Department of Roads intends to invest 1.339 billion. Honorable Speaker on Technology, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development through conditional grants will continue to do their farmer producer support units. But how this is affected under technology is that the, the department has further moved towards the fourth industrial revolution, wherein agricultural drones are being utilized for fungicides, weedicides, and pesticides. Likewise, the security drones are also utilized for surveillance to, to curtail and to curb livestock threats across the province. I'm sure SAPS is very happy about that and specifically in particular areas of Tabanchu, Batsabelo and Lady Brand. Honorable Speaker Destia has also supported the SMME startups by investing in the Batsabelo ICT hub and the office of the Premier in the CUT 4IR program. On industrialization, Honorable Speaker, we have areas such as Malutia Pufung, Batsabelo, Tabanchu as key drivers in the strategy for the ongoing stimulation of our provincial economy. In the case of Maluti Apufung, we continue to rent out existing factories for manufacturing and services industries to a lesser extent in retail, wholesale, warehousing, storage. We have a total of 296 factories in Puta de Chaba. Industrial Park, and a further 140 in Botsabello. Land and tailor-made top structures are available in the Maluti Apufung Special Economic Zone. Developing an industrialization, manufacturing, and producing economy within this province is high on the priority of the Free State Growth and Development Strategy and our executive. This will not only create job opportunities, but will further provide access for SMMEs and other linking economic sectors. On investment promotion, Honorable Speaker, you'll tell me that there is nothing wrong with the creation of a marketing strategy for our province. Honorable Speaker, we call upon investors to explore the possibilities of this province. We have a young, youthful, and vibrant, productive population. We would like to urge local government to be innovative in their various investment incentives while sticking to the regulatory prescripts in calling for solutions or proposals. The conditional grants contributes a contribution to the municipalities and metros are going to be presented as follows. In Mangaun, and just a quick overview, Honorable Speaker, Mangaun has the ability to reignite the logistics and freight hub, including the finalization of plans for the cargo port at Braham Fisher International Airport. It will continue with the investment of the N8 corridor and the regeneration of the CBD. Conditional grants allocated to Mangaun amount to 938.3 million during the 22-23 financial year. Honorable Major. That's your expenditure framework on conditional grants. Karip. Karip is the direct, the largest district in the province in terms of ge geographical size, making up just one more than a third of its ge geographical area. Home to the biggest dam in South Africa, rich in sheep and ostrich farming, and an advantageous service area for the sun's radius. Opportunity in this area are mixed farming opportunity, renewable energy and energy saving data centers, tourism. Mayors, you've got a beautiful district and it's long underdeveloped 
and it's time we move with great and vast and robust development in this district. The conditional grants invested in Karib district amounts to 318.7 million. Tabo Futsanyana, this district has huge potential for tourism development because of its beautiful scenery between um, and its rich cultural heritage. The N3 and N5 national roads pass through this district and the famous Golden Gate is found in the area on the slopes of the Drakensberg. Conditional grants allocated to this district amounts to 1.635 billion rands. Fezile Dabi district, the Friedefort Dome, being the third largest meteorite site in the world, is located within this district. And although this district has the smallest geographical area in the province, it has the largest growth by sector performance in the province. The conditional grant amount allocated for this year amounts to 1.033 billion. Lejwele Putswa, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Premier, this district makes up almost a third of the province and is accessible from Johannesburg, Cape Town, Clarksdorp and Kimberley along the N1, one of the country's main national roads. The key sectors are agriculture, mining, construction and transport. We have an amount of 1.226 billion allocated to this district for this financial year. The economic cluster in the various departments and entities will outline further plans, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Premier, to stimulate the economy during the individual department budget speeches. So that is on job creation and the economy. I'd like us now to discuss governance, but I'd just like to take a sip of water. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Honorable Speaker, governance has been very topical for the Free State Province, and I would like to commend our Honorable Premier for a harsh stance on dealing with governance reforms in this province. The sixth administration is dedicated to dealing with governance issues. Malibongwe, Honorable Premier. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development describes value for money as striking the best balance between three E's, the economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. So how is value for money integrated in governance? And let me explain that to you through the fiscal framework. Speaker, the trajectory of fiscal consolidation remains steadfast over the medium-term expenditure framework. We continued as a means of curbing government debt and fiscal deficits. The provincial fiscus remains tight as compared to the growing needs for services. Our role is to ensure that very limited RAND, the very limited RAND, in our disposal meets the expectations of our citizens. We have to be bold. We have to take harsh decisions to seek and to maximize service delivery for our people. In this medium-term expenditure framework, we will continue with our chosen fiscal strategy, and it includes, amongst others, thorough evaluation of budget baselines, identification of savings, reprioritization of budgets to key budgetary pressures, creation of provincial reserves for emergencies and disasters, scaling down on non-core programs and the prioritization of high-impact programs such as delivery of infrastructure projects. In creation of efficiencies, we will continue to strengthen our oversight to ensure timely implementation of projects and programs, and a critical aspect of these strategies, Madam Speaker, is to ensure that the right skills must be employed for the job at hand. Risk and audit plays a critical role for value for money, and it means that, Honorable Speaker, the appointment of strong audit committees will have to be of great value towards this effective oversight and to hold entities and departments accountable. The province, we are confident that complementary skills in these committees have the intended good governance and will improve and meet our departmental uh, targets. The risk and audit committees provide a second level of ethical and good governance oversight 
function to all departments outside of executive authorities and members of the provincial legislature. On audits, Honorable Speaker, and the audit improvements, Honorable Premier, we were delighted by the recognition given by the Auditor General inciting the year-on-year -year progress in the annual financial statements in the province. Although the outcomes for 2021-22 remain stagnant, one clean audit and the others is, it, it is outlined in our documents presented to you, although we remain stagnant in the 2019-20 financial year, there was an improvement of 29% in the number of disclaimer qualifications and paragraphs for the 2021 20, 2021 from, the, from 22 to 31 in the previous financial year. So in the 1920, let me just make this clear, in the 1920 financial year, we had 31 dis disclaimer or qualification paragraphs. In the year thereafter, 2021, we had 22 disclaimer paragraphs. So the total non-compliance with laws, regulations by departments and entities improved by 5% from 169 to 161 in the later year. No department in this year dis received a disclaimer. No department in the province has received a disclaimer audit opinion for the 2021-2020 financial year. One entity retained a disclaimer of audit opinion, and that's the Free State Development Corporation in the 2020-21 financial year. Honorable Speaker, our executive authorities, accounting officers, chief executive officers, chief financial officers, and senior management in the department signed pledges on the 11th of November 2021 to quality service delivery, good governance, fiscal and financial management to further promote the improvement of audit outcomes in the province. This project was led by our Honorable Premier, leading from the top, Kia Leboamma. On irregular expenditure, to reduce the accumulated irregular expenditure of the province, Exco endorsed and initiated an intervention project for the investigation of irregular expenditure incurred in previous years to reduce the backlog of investigations. Our project started in 2019 in March with investigations in five departments one and one entity, and this continued for two, two years until the 12th of March 2021. During this period, we investigated 4,503 cases to the value of 13.5 billion across all three state departments and the entity. 322 cases to the value of approximately 130.3 million could be removed from the irregular expenditure reporting as those determining tests revealed that expenditure does not meet the definition of that irregular expenditure as stipulated in the PFMA. 609 cases to the value of 2 million and 72 were identified where possible losses were identified that the accounting officer should further investigate and take action for recoveries of those money. If needed, Madam Speaker, the 235 attendance certificates were issued to officials that attended those training sessions in PWC uh, as part of the governance school and capacity building. Madam Speaker, to enhance the existing internal controls, the root causes for these transgressions were determined through investigation and remedial controls recommended to further prevent future irregular expenditure. Consequence management is an integral part of reducing this irregular expenditure in the province, and therefore such investigation reports were finalized during the names and roles of all officials involved in the procurement and payment process led to that irregular expenditure. This allows then accounting officers to co consider implement the relevant disciplinary processes through the human resource and legal units. Honorable Speaker, we have been criticized that we've got too many acting HODs in our department. We have been criticized that we've reviewed CFOs and supply chains within our department. This EXCO has been criticized to say that we have changed committees within our departments. 
but this is part of the consequence management that our Honourable Premier and this executive team has dealt with to ensure that we deal with the transgressions and the rising irregular expenditure. Honourable Speaker, this should also set the tone for changing the behaviour of officials when it gets to compliance with laws and regulations of goods and services. Treasury continues to monitor the reporting of regular expenditure by departments and entities on a monthly basis, and those recommendations are made to the executive authorities for consideration. On fraud and corruption, Honourable Speaker, the province continues with its collaborative approach with other government institution key stakeholders to ensure that the province combats fraud and corruption to its root. As a result, the province continuously holds an anti-fraud and corruption session with HODs, CEOs, municipal managers, led by Chapter 9 institutions and experts for the rollout of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy. To give effect on the implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy, the province will focus on the alignment of departmental and public entity strategies through fraud and ethics risk management. Last two matters on governance, the management of our financial purse. On liquidity, Madam Speaker, the province continues to enhance the liquidity management to sustain a cash positive position that allows us to meet our daily obligations without impeding on payments to suppliers. Henceforth, the reduction of our 30-day payments. We continue to invest in excess cash on short-term periods to generate an additional revenue in the form of interest income. We have thus far generated a total amount of 18 million in the current financial year. We will continue with our intent to build much needed provincial reserves to positively respond to cases of emergencies, disasters. However, this would be executed carefully, taking into account the requirement for service delivery in our province. On municipalities, Honourable Speaker, Honourable Premier, Honourable Dukwana, you will agree that the effective governance is a key driver for change. And therefore, Provincial Treasury and COCTA and SALGA has commenced with an integrated councillor portfolio training from the 8th to the 30th of March 2022 on the back of integrated councillor induction programmes in February 2022 to the newly elected councillors in order to provide them with the relevant knowledge and skills on the following areas. Oversight leadership in respect of key portfolio committees, legislation that's applicable to local government, municipal budget pressures, and MSCOA and service delivery. The macro learning pathway will support the municipal troika, and troika is the mayor's chief whips as well as the speakers, to move to a more formal training NQF level six process. So every new councillor in terms of the mayor, speaker, chief whip and identified councillors will have an NQF level six accreditation after they've completed this program. And this is sponsored by LG CETA and the Central University of Technology to improve governance and oversight. The ICIP and portfolio trainings is the first pathway to incorporate councillors for this development of this preliminary tra trajectory to effective governance. The departments of COCTA and Treasury will further embark on a provincial roadshow focusing on good governance, accountability, financial management and service delivery. Honourable Speaker now brings us to the business of the day and that is our 2022-23 medium-term expenditure and uh, fiscal framework. Speaker, once again, I want to emphasize that amidst this financial and fiscal challenges, the formulation of this budget was not easy, but our Executive Council's purpose remains clear. It is therefore our commitment to ensure financial prudence, accountability and responsiveness in the use of this limited public funds. Honourable Speaker, we take wise counsel from our African forebearers who taught us the wisdom of working together. The lesson from them is if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. 
and this is exactly what our executive has embarked on. The budget we're proposing today is underscored by the collective wisdom and counsel of all our key stakeholders. Firstly, the Executive Council, the recommendations of our PROPAC committee, the forum of departments of heads of departments, our diverse departments and stakeholder and entities. So it's called Forum of HODs, it's a long acronym. So it's CEOs, HODs all sit in that forum on a technical basis. The budget is underpinned by numerous intense discussions and consensus reached once again by the following forums. And these are sectoral meetings at national, so each department in the various sectors have a national consultation. The Technical Committee on Finance called TCF, the Fiscal and Finance Committee, which representatives are here today, Budget Council and Budget Forum, where both Minister Finance and Minister Cocter sits together with all MSCs and relevant officials, and Cabinet meetings. Madam Speaker, there are many other consultations at the provincial level, which includes our medium-term expenditure hearings, the national benchmarking exercise, national treasury, the budget lehotla, we do pu public participation, we do the school's budget competition, and finally, when it comes to the executive, it's packaged and for delivery. Speaker, we come to the rands and cents, the provincial fiscal framework in the 2022 medium-term financial year period amounts to 122.067 billion rand. So for this medium-term expenditure framework over the three years, our fiscal amount is 122.067 billion rand. And this represents an increase of 0.9%, very far below, below inflation. But when compared to the 21-22 budget, Madam Speaker, the province estimates to spend more than 122 billion in the next three years. And how it's constituted is 40.987 billion in 2022-23, 39.864 billion in 23-24, and 41.215 billion in 24-25. The provincial budget framework is derived from three revenue sources, and these are the equitable share, provincial owned revenue, and conditional grants. And let me outline that to you, Honorable Speaker. On provincial owned revenue, we estimate that over the medium term expenditure framework, we will collect 1.143 billion in 22-23. 1.165 billion in 23-24 and 1.168 billion in 24-25 financial year. Honourable Speaker, I must mention to the House that Exco and Treasury, together with all departments and entities, are continuing on working on various improvement systems to generate revenue and revenue management to increase these allocations. It's the only way we're going to stimulate the economy and deal with our fiscal deficit. Conditional grants, honorable speaker, is allocated to the province of 26.267 billion over the medium term expenditure framework period. In 22-23, we'll receive 8.737 billion. In 2020, 324, 8.591 billion, and in the outer year, 8.3 939 billion. Madam Speaker, these grants fund infrastructure projects such as construction, maintenance of schools, clinics, roads, provision of housing uh, for deserving families, key healthcare programs, and community social programs such as early childhood centers and non government organizations. Coming to the financial allocations, I'm going to place it within clusters and then departments. And Honourable Speaker, I'd like to just advise the House that there is a People's Guide budget that you will receive. It allocates all the priorities of every department and cluster. And we want to state that each MEC, during their own budget vote, will outline their priority programs. So Honourable Speaker, our township economy and local business in terms of the economic cluster are essential to the province growing economy. 
investment in, in, infra in agriculture, infrastructure, creation of local industries and tourism must be increased. This is the recommendations from the clusters uh, decisions during our budget lehotla. We must reduce unemployment, especially amongst young people in this province and women. The province will invest more than 22.8 billion on economic and infrastructure programs over the medium term expenditure framework. For human settlements, Honorable MEC Duquana, we are assured in your leadership we, you develop and release state and privately owned land for the residential and community purposes for the creation of sustainable human settlements. Honorable Speaker, I would like to commend the department and understand that they will spend more than 4.123 billion implementing its key sector priorities over this medium term expenditure framework. In the main, the budget allocation to the department provides for the implementation of the comprehensive human settlement in the province and they are allocated as follows. Total allocations for human settlement is 1.332 billion in 22-23. 1.368 billion in the 23-24 financial year and 1.422 billion in the 24-25 financial year. That equates to the 4.123 billion. You may spur Honorable MEC Duquana to make sure that all those monies are spent. Thank you very much. On public works and infrastructure, MEC Kuloi, we are confident in you to resolve and manage them and maintain the following public assets. Honorable Speaker, this department plays a critical and important role in ensuring that provincial infrastructure projects are implement, implemented on time and within the allocated budget. As far as the expanded public works program is concerned, the department has achieved all its targets, namely 2,174 work opportunities created in cash for waste, 319 community work program, 657 cleaning and greening, 791 township revitalization programs, 93 youth service programs, 302 and EPWP administration, which was 12. Honourable Speaker, the Department will spend a total amount of 5.683 billion over the medium term expenditure framework period and it's outlined as follows. 1.814 billion in 22-23, 1.774 billion in 23-24 and 2.094 billion in 24-25. These allocations include an amount of 1.542 billion allocated for rates and taxes, as well as infrastructure enhancement allocations of 264.1 million earmarked for township revitalization projects over the medium term expenditure framework. Yes, we will be making sure that our municipalities receive an amount of 1.542 billion just for rates and taxes. These allocations for 22-23 include 6.2 million for the expanded works program. This program remains a crucial and critical program for creating jobs in our province. And one of our students, very smart students we have in this province, says it may not be sustainable, but it does provide stimulation to the economy on a temporary basis. On police, roads and transport, MEC Bulwani, Thank you for your supporting free status in, in promoting integrated crime prevention initiatives and a program of action to improve road safety. Honorable Speaker, the execution of the multiple mandates that fall within the scope of this department is supported by a budget allocation of 2.794 billion in 22-23, 2.841 billion in 23-24 and 3.017 billion in 24-25. On agriculture and rural development, MEC Nangisa, we are reliant on your leadership to reignite free state to the food basket status of South Africa. Honorable Speaker, food security is the lifeblood of all evolving economies and therefore remains central to improving our economy. 
The department receives an amount of 830.6 million in 22-23, 803.7 million in 23-24, and 849.5 million in 24-25. Over the medium-term expenditure framework, the department is estimated to spend an amount of 2.484 billion. On economic small business, Development, Tourism and Environmental Affairs, Destia, MEC Mohale, we are on, a, on the right trajectory to transform the free state economy in harmony with its natural resources. Honorable Speaker, the Department continues to play a central coordinating role in our efforts to achieve economic transformation and growth within our province. We further indicated the need for inclusive economic growth that creates jobs and pushes back the challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. Destia's mandate further includes regulation and support of small, medium, and micro business enterprises, tourism, as well as the protection and management of the environment. This department is allocated an amount of 631.7 million for 22 23. 619.6 million for 23-24 and 663.6 million for 24-25. Over the medium term expenditure framework, the departments estimated an amount of 1.915 billion. Our transfers for this financial year to the FTC is 6 million, Maluti Apufung Special Economic Zone 20 million, Free State Gambling and Liquor Authority, which is 104 million, which equates to 130 million. Honorable Speaker, I'd like to move to the social cluster. These allocations to the so social cluster amounts to 31.8 billion in the 22-23 financial year, 30.7 billion and 31.1 billion in the outer years. The allocation represents an average proportionate share of 77% of the total budget over the medium term expenditure framework. We will continue, Madam Speaker, protecting the sector in view of its critical role in the development of our communities. But I must also hasten to indicate that the allocations towards projects have the potential to ignite the economy and must be increased over the medium term expenditure framework. And in this regard, there are ongoing discussions with the Executive Council to address this matter to the economy for financial prudence and amidst the constrained financial space. Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it. To MEC Mahwe, we once again would like to use this opportunity to congratulate the department for their sterling word, work and applaud you for maintaining the top performance status during the National Senior Certificate Pass Results. Congratulations, MEC. Speaker, education is a major determinant of economic growth, employment and earnings. We have allocated an additional equitable share fund of 1.359 billion over the medium term expenditure framework. The allocation is to assist in addressing the pressures related to the number of educators in schools and other shortfalls within the sector. Further, an earmarked allocation of 397 million for the 22-23 financial year, 394 million for 23-24 financial year is allocated for the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative. Congratulations, young educators of this province. The 22 medium, yes, thank you. The 22 medium expenditure framework allocation for the department amounts to 17.293 billion in 2022-23, 16.814 billion in 23-24, and 16.622 billion in the outer financial year. Cumulatively, the department is allocated an amount of 50.729 billion over the medium term expenditure framework. Honourable Speaker on Health, allow me and allow me to equally join our Honourable Premier in congratulating the Department of Health on attaining the number one in the country with regards to the vaccination rollout. Congratulations, Emily. 
Honourable Member's health is an essential in eradicating extreme poverty and promoting economic growth and well-being to our citizenry. We have allocated additional funds, totaling 380 million to the department to address the baselines for COE, which is con compensation of employees, medicine, food and food supplies in the issue of NHLS in the 24-25 financial year. Over the medium term expenditure framework, the department projects to spend more than 37.453 billion. The allocation is aggregated or disaggregated as follows. 12.711 in 2022-23 financial year, 12.075 billion in 23-24, and 12.666 billion in the 24-25 financial years. On social development, Madam Speaker, social development led by our MEC, MEC Kabate, remains central in the fight against social ills such as poverty, homelessness, drug and substance abuse, as well as women and children abuse and prevalent gender-based violence. Honourable Members, I am delighted to indicate that, to the House that the Department implemented an upgrading of Masubatela from Level 2 to Level 3. Congratulations and well done, MEC, to do those, that for our people. <laughs> Furthermore, the Department officially launched the State of the Art, a State of the Art Substance Dependency Treatment Centre in Botabelo during April 2021. This department is allocated 1.179 billion in 22-23, 1.160 billion in 23-24, and 1.247 billion in 24-25. The allocations will include earmark funding to the tune of 436 million over the medium term expenditure framework. We have also allocated an additional 6.5 million and 6.780 million and 7.085 million for the appointment of 92 social workers. <laughs> On sports, arts, culture and recreation, Honourable Speaker, let me allow, am I allowed to thank MEC Mahasa? MEC Mahasa, thank you for supporting local artists in townships, commencing with a program of change and we all await the relaunch of the Makufe Festival. Yes, Allah, Allah. The impact of the pandemic on this industry cannot be denied. We acknowledge the key activities for the cultural and sport-related programs that have long been the impetus for social cohesion and socio-economic growth. In, within our communities and therefore we continue to be an essential way to advance our developmental goal agenda. The impact of the pandemic on this industry cannot be denied and it has been very tough on those individuals and businesses within this industry. We acknowledge the key activities of cultural and sport related programs and we have a strong impetus for the social cohesion within our communities. The budget allocation for the Department of Sports, Arts, Culture and Recreation totals an amount of 1.976 billion over the medium term expenditure framework divided as follows. 665.7 million in 22-23, 650.4 million in 23-24 and 659.7 million in the outer year. Honourable Speaker, allow me to go over to the governance cluster, but before I do that, sports, arts and recreations totals amount to 1.976 billion over the medium term expenditure framework. On the governance, yes, thank you. That is the social cluster, ladies and gentlemen. We're moving to the governance cluster, honorable speaker. And within the governance cluster, our vision is also clear that our goal is to rebuild a competent, ethical and developmental state or province. We must continue to work on institutionalization of a clean, responsive, accountable and effective and efficient government. Over the next financial year, the three departments, including the Free State Legislature, which is the arm of the state, will spend an amount of 5.181 billion. 
the Office of the Premier. Honourable Speaker, I'd like to congratulate the Honourable Premier for the bold decision, Honourable Premier, that you took to create a service delivery technical team comprised of civil and electrical engineers, quantity surveyors, town planners, ICT specialists to support your oversight role, Honourable Premier. This, once again, Honourable Premier, Honourable Speaker, we would like to appreciate your visionary, your decisive and diligent leadership. The Office of the Premier received 6.88.7 million in 22-23, 6.83 million in 23-24, and 6.83.65 million in 24-25. Over the medium term ahead, the Office of the Premier will be estimating to spend 2.055 billion. On cooperative governance and traditional affairs, Honourable Speaker, the district development model, Honourable Dukwana, is a tool for alignment and collaborative planning and implementation across all spheres of government. Thank you, MEC Dukwana, for driving the municipal agenda for change. It is vital, vital for delivery of basic services to our communities. Our governments resolve to enhance integrated planning amongst the fears of government is a great step towards achieving that financial and technical efficiencies from the limited financial resources at our disposal. COCTA is allocated 427.2 million in 2022-23, 428.035 million in 23-24 and 440.2 million in 24-25 financial year. Over the medium term ahead, the department is estimated to spend 1.296 billion over the next three financial years. On Provincial Treasury, Honourable Speaker, our oversight role is key in ensuring that very limited public resources are utilised in an economic and effective and efficient man manner. Honourable Speaker, Treasury is allocated 317.2 million in 22-23, 317.7 million in 23-24 and 330.2 million in 24-25. We operate a very lean machine. The provincial treasury is estimated to spend 965 million over the medium term expenditure framework. Speaker, on the provincial legislature, I'd like to thank you for directing and inspiring the members of our legislature for your leadership as the executive authority. The provincial legislature remains at the heart of institutionalizing accountability and public sector. Making sure that the limited resources yields better tangible services for our people this August House and its related communities play a central role in ensuring the sustainability of our public sector. Our provincial legislature is allocated 294.6 million in 22-23 financial year, 285.5 million in 23-24, and 285.5 million in 24-25. In total, the legislature is estimated to spend an amount of 865.7 million over the medium term expenditure framework. Should there be a need for additional allocations to the provincial legislature, we will review and affect those changes during this year's adjustment budget. In conclusion, Honourable Speaker, permit me to express my indebtedness to the Honourable Premier and my colleagues in the Executive Council for their collective wisdom, for the inspiration, for their positive criticism and intervention that they have brought to the budget improvement processes. I am grateful to the oversight function rendered by the different legislature committees and my appreciation goes out to the Chief Whip and the Chairperson of the PROPAC Committee as well as all its, of its members for their oversight role and holding departments accountable to their targets, to their budgets, their performance plans and to you, the electorate. The technical contributions of our DG, Ntate Radikonsani, 
and the heads of departments, our chief financial officers, our CEOs, during the finalization of the budgets are equally applauded. Also allow me to convey my gratitude to the short but dynamite acting head of Department of Provincial Treasury, together with our senior management and the officials who have worked with diligent enthusiasm to ensure that we produce a budget that transforms the needs and aspirations of our people into concrete and achievable programs. I would further like to thank the leadership of the African National Congress for their trust that we as this EXCO would be able to execute our various deployments ethically with humility and professionalism. Lastly, I'd like to thank my family, my sisters in the house today, for their unwavering support and courage. I'm so grateful for your patience and your tolerance. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to the people of the Free State Province, to you too. You're the reason why we wake up every morning. You're the reason why we don't sleep every night. And you are absolutely the reason why we stay humble. This budget is for the free staters on behalf of our Honorable Premier and our, on behalf of our executive and its collective. This is our program of action. Honorable Speaker, I hear by table the 2022 uh, appropriation bill. I'd like to also provide the People's Guide to the Budget, the estimates of the provincial revenue and expenditure framework and the economic outlook for and behalf of this province. May God bless you all. Amandla, thank you. Directors, not yet. Not yet, Honorable. Not yet, Honorable MEC. What does the Honorable MEC propose? That the bill be referred to the Portfolio Committee on Public Accounts and Finance, as well as the Budget and Oversight Committee for consideration and report back to the House. Any discussion, Honorable Members? Any objections? Approved uh, the bill stands. The bill stands referred to Portfolio Committee on Public Accounts and Finance as well as Budget and Oversight Committee for consideration and um, report back. Honorable members. That brings us to the end of the business of the House today. But before the House adjourns, I wish to make the following announcements. That honorable members and guests should remain standing at their located seats as the Sergeant at Arms, the Honorable Speaker, and the Secretary leave the House. That the guests should remain at their located seats while the honorable members leave the house and that all guests with the dark blue color on the background of the text will have their lunch served at the tent behind the chamber and that all guests with their white background in their text will have their lunch served here in this marquee tent. That a media briefing will be held inside this marquee tent at the back next to the door. Um, the next sitting of the legislature will be on Tuesday, the 22nd March 2022 at 10 o'clock at the 4th Ratsal Bloemfontein and the business of the day will include the general debate on the appropriation bill, the House's agenda.
Venezuela. Man, we we just uh, finished off, and we're about to go live into interviews. Hello. Yeah. Hello. So, see, see. Budget speech. Yeah. 
budget speech 2022.